Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. For our main topic today, we'll be talking about CFIT, or Controlled Flight into Terrain, and about the huge differences in terrain protection you receive when you're getting vectors while VFR versus when you're being vectored under IFR. And we'll tell you the story of a recent CFIT accident that has an unexpected twist to the story. And it's a new year, which is when a pilot's thoughts turn to, yes, buying an airplane. So if you're thinking about buying a new or used Cirrus SR-20, SR-22, or Vision Jet, call me today at 650-967-2500 for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 133, we talked with Robert De Laurentiis about his flight over the South Pole and gave updates on some of our other top stories from 2019. So if you missed it, you may want to check it out. And just a quick note, if you haven't already, please click the subscribe button on your phone. Not only will that alert you when new shows are available each week, but it will also boost our rankings, making it more likely that other people will find the show. Coming up this week in the news, ADSB is now required in some U.S. airspace, and we have several related stories. And if you're planning on taking an FAA written exam, there's now a new procedure you need to follow. Plus, there are some FAA services that are going away. All this and more, and the news starts now. From generalaviationnews.com, almost 80,000 GA aircraft now are ADSB equipped. Those are the latest statistics from the FAA. They show that as December 1st, the number is 79,214. Total number of all aircraft equipped before the January 2020 mandate requiring ADSB out in certain airspace is 111,400 aircraft, according to the agency. The data does not include experimental aircraft or light sport aircraft. The data also shows the number of NPE aircraft, that is, non-performing emitters. According to agency officials, NPE aircraft include any ADSB out system that is not transmitting in compliance with FAR 21.227. The reasons for non-compliance vary from hardware that doesn't meet the performance standards to installation errors to operational errors by pilots. Also from General Aviation News, a separate story, test your ADSB compliance before January 1. Well, of course, now you got to test it after it. With the ADSB out mandate now in effect, aircraft owners are encouraged to test their equipment to ensure it's in compliance. That's especially true for aircraft owners who equipped with ADSB before 2015, according to officials with Duncan Aviation. If you upgraded to ADSB before 2015, it's likely the transponders were manufactured to the DO-260 or 260A standard, which was an earlier requirement for flying in Australia and other parts of the world. However, the version the FAA adopted for the flying in the U.S. airspace is DO-260B. The 260B standard was adopted because it eliminates latency and adds enunciation requirements, Duncan officials explain. Many of the aircraft with NPEs were likely installed more than four years ago or prior to changes made in the mandate and implemented over the years after its initial announcement. How to test whether you are compliant? Well, about one hour after a flight, go to the FAA's website and request a public ADSB performance report, or PAPR. The PAPR helps you verify that your ADSB equipment is properly functioning. And I'll include a link to that site in our show notes if you want to test your ADSB out. And from AOPA.org, ADSB privacy is now available. The FAA's Privacy IKO program, which is PIA, announced in early November, quietly went live Thursday, December 19th. PAI allows aircraft operators to increase operational privacy by requesting an alternate temporary IKO aircraft address that is not associated with the aircraft owner in the Civil Aviation Registry. In 2020, the FAA will transition the program to private providers. And also from AOPA.org, owners seek a battery ADSB in non-electric aircraft. A group of Texas pilots has petitioned the FAA seeking an exemption from the agency's ADSB rules, but they're not trying to avoid equipping with a mandated new technology. They're seeking an accommodation that would allow them to install ADSB out in their airplane. They're asking for an exemption for their stock Ragwing 1946 Luscom 8A, which they've based at El Paso International Airport, located in a Class C airspace, since 2002. Quote, this exemption would allow the installation and practical operation of a battery-powered ADSB system in an aircraft that was not originally certificated with an electrical system or that has not subsequently been certified with such a system, 
by allowing the ADSB system to be turned off upon entering uncontrolled airspace, the petition reads. Now, here's something I didn't realize. FAR 91.225F requires that ADSB out equipment be operated in the transmit mode at all times, regardless of whether it's in ADSB rule airspace or not. This would add a capability of operating the aircraft with the ADSB turned off, similar to the existing process allowed for transponders under FAR 91.215C, the petition states. All we want to do is keep things as we are, operate from our Class C airspace, and cooperate with ATC. We want ADSB out too, explained Jim Ivey of Clint, Texas, who is coordinating the exemption effort on behalf of the Luscombe's five owners. The Luscombe is equipped with a certified transponder installation and a communications radio powered by a battery that's connected to a trickle charger in the hangar. They use the transponder and radio to depart the Class C airspace, then turn them off to conserve battery power so that they can reverse the process and talk and readily be radar identified when they're ready to re-enter the Class C airspace. We're not asking for an exemption in rural airspace, Ivy says. We want to be seen by everybody. We're asking for the ability to save their limited battery power for the return to Class C airspace. Right now, we can't equip because it's going to cause us to be non-compliant at some point when the battery dies or when we turn off the ADSB switch. We have decades of experience with a Mode C transponder in the panel. It just comes down to that always-on requirement. If the Luscombe's owner petition is approved, it would streamline the approval process for any other operators of non-electrical aircraft using battery-powered transponders who want to equip with ADSB, said Rune Duke of AOPA. And from the FAA.gov website, the FAA is now going to be requiring a tracking number when you take a written exam. The FAA awarded a new Airman Knowledge Testing contract called the Airman Certificate Testing Service, or ACS. The ACS contract is a comprehensive best practices approach aimed at enhancing the overall quality of FAA Airman Knowledge Testing. As a result, there are several enhancements going into effect as of January 13th that are changes from current procedures as indicated below. Beginning January 13, 2020, all applicants must establish an FAA tracking number, or FTN, within IACRA before taking an FAA Airman Knowledge Test. And for people unfamiliar with IACRA, you just go out to iacra.faa.gov. That's the website where you've had to go to in the last few years anytime you are taking a check ride. And essentially, you fill out what used to be the paper 8710 form inside IACRA first. Well, you're now going to have to do that for written exams as well. The story continues, the identification number will be printed on the applicant's Airman Knowledge Test Report in replacement of the applicant ID number. Why the change? Currently, when applicants take a knowledge test, they provide the Knowledge Testing Center a form of ID that differs from the name they provide on the electronic or paper application, and that can lead to return files and lengthy delays in the certification process. These and similar problems can be reduced by utilizing the FAA tracking number generated when an applicant creates a profile in the Integrated Airman Certification and Rating Application, or IACRA system. Requiring all applicants for FAA certification to obtain an FTN in IACRA prior to taking a knowledge test will allow the FAA to rely on the name in the IACRA profile for all actions associated with that applicant. The registration process takes only a few minutes. And from generalaviationnews.com, the FAA is going to be decommissioning HIWAS in January. The FAA will discontinue the Hazardous In-Flight Weather Advisory Service, HIWAS, in the lower 48 states on January 8th. HIWAS is a continuous broadcast of weather advisories over a limited nationwide network of VORs, providing pilots with information related to hazardous weather. For example, here in California, when I counted, we had about 40 VORs, and I think about a dozen of them had HIWAS available. The agency's decision comes in the wake of decreased demand for in-flight services from flight service specialists in general, dropping from an average of more than 10,000 radio contacts a day to less than 900 a day, which the FAA said is an indication pilots are using other ways to obtain weather information. There are numerous other products that provide pilots with the needed weather information, said Heidi Williams, NBAA's Director of Air Traffic Services and Infrastructure. We no longer rely solely on the aircraft radio for access to weather information in the cockpit, Instead, we have access to a number of resources we didn't have when HIWAS was created. This greatly mitigates any impact of decommissioning what we found in the course of our review to be a little-used product. And just a few days ago, on January 1st, the FAA discontinued a similar service in Alaska, the Transcribed Weather Broadcast, or TWEBS, 
which is a continual broadcast of aeronautical and meteorological information over a limited network of VORs and NDBs across Alaska. From iPadPilotNews.com, Flight Service debuts a new mobile-friendly site for iPhone and Android. It's good to see the FAA removing unused services in addition to adding new ones as part of the next-gen transition. What has been overlooked, though, are recent improvements coming from Lidos, the FAA contractor responsible for running flight service. They recently released a new mobile-friendly version of the 1-800-WX-BRIEF website, making it much easier to use on iPhone and Android devices. The site loads remarkably fast and is very easy to use. Grab your phone and head over to 1-800-WXBRIEF.COM. You can access some of the basic features right away from the menu at the top left of the screen without needing to log in first. To get the most out of the site, though, you'll want to sign in with your flight service account. Registration is free if you don't have an account. It then takes just one tap of the map button from the redesigned dashboard, and you'll be looking at an interactive display depicting text weather reports, radar imagery, and PIREPs. Just like with aviation mobile apps, a layers menu accessible from the top right of the screen allows you to customize the map and view additional overlays like airmets, satellite imagery, TFRs, icing probability, severity forecast, and much more. And from FlyingMag.com, Open Airplane and Fly Auto have shut down operations. Open Airplane and Fly Auto ceased operations on December 29th. The aircraft rental and charter service sought to make processes easier and with less hassle for pilots and prospective passengers. Co-founder and President Rod Rakick, who we've had here on this show, cited a discrepancy between the stated desire of pilots to use the Open Airplane service and the numbers that actually showed up as a cause of its closure. And by the way, I have read elsewhere that a total of 25,000 pilots had signed up for open airplane, but apparently far fewer are actually using it. On the charter side, Fly Auto needed far more capital to get to sustainability than the company's leadership had first assumed, and lack of access to growth capital made it impossible to get there, according to Raykick. Open Airplane was the first of the services launched by Raykick and his colleagues, service focused on delivering an aircraft rental experience that pilots could take with them as they traveled, minimizing the frustration of making multiple checkouts in aircraft of the same model from different providers. Rakic notes that he left his day job in mid-2013 when the beta platform for Open Airplane launched, and it's been his daily raison d'etre ever since, so that would be French for reason for being. Obsession is the level of commitment, he said in an interview with Flying. Co-founder Adam Fast was the smarts behind the curtains, while Rakic provided the hustle he gained fame for around the GA industry. All flights booked forward, 7 to February 2020, have been canceled, at least through the open airplane platform. Flight schools can make a business choice to honor those checkouts. And from FAA.gov, FAA issues important charter guidance to pilots and passengers. And this is the story regarding Blackbird. Today, booking a charter flight can be as easy as tapping a few buttons on your mobile device, but that doesn't mean the flight is legal or safe. The FAA's top priority is ensuring the safety of the traveling public, and it's critical that both pilots and passengers confirm that the charter flights they're providing and receiving comply with all applicable FARs. If you pay for a charter flight, you are entitled to a higher level of safety than is required from a free flight from a friend. Among other things, pilots who transport paying passengers must have the required qualifications and training, are subject to random drug and alcohol testing, and the aircraft used must be maintained to the high standards that the FAA's charter regulations require. The FAA recently sent a letter about this issue to a company called Blackbird Air that created a web-based application that connects pilots with passengers. The letter emphasizes an FAA policy about the requirement for pilots who are paid to fly passengers. The policy states that pilots who are paid to fly passengers generally can't just hold the required commercial or ATP pilot certificate. They also must be employed by the company operating the flight which must hold a certificate issued under Part 119 of the FARs, or the pilot must themselves hold a Part 119 certificate. Any pilot who provides charter flights without complying with the Part 119 certificate requirement would be violating the FARs, even if they possess a commercial or ATP pilot certificate. The FAA's determination has been upheld in federal court. So it seems like the FAA is putting on notice both Blackbird and pilots who fly for them that the FAA feels that not all aspects of those operations meet the full FAR requirements. And from iPadPilotNews.com, ForeFlight adds cloud top forecast and new IFR features. The latest update, version 11.11, 
add some exciting new features you can start using right away. Notum alerts in the root editor, ForeFlight has made significant strides over the last decade at getting pilots to look at Notums by placing important airport and procedural Notums in commonly viewed screens throughout the app. For example, runway and airport closure Notums are displayed with a red banner right on the airport screen, and Notums related to instrument approach procedures can be accessed right from the top of each chart. With the latest update, ForeFlight will now display a red alert symbol on the airport ID bubble in the root editor to warn you about an airport or runway closure. Tap on the airport ID and select View Alert Notum to see the details. This will show just the runway or airport closure Notum, and you can then select Show All Notums to view the complete list for the airport. Notum warnings in the root editor are only available on iPad, not on iPhone or on ForeFlight Web. And they've also included new weather imagery, including cloud tops. Here's some good news for fans of the graphical forecast for aviation, or GFA, on the aviationweather.gov website. Many of these forecast charts are now available in the weather imagery section in ForeFlight. GFA relies on computer models to predict unique weather attributes, like the height of cloud tops and bases across the U.S. GFA also forecasts surface conditions of rain, snow, visibility, winds, and IFR conditions. The new cloud and surface forecast replaced the GFS MOS ceiling and visibility graphical forecast products, which NOAA discontinued in mid-December 2019. Instrument approach details on the map. A display of instrument approach altitude and airspeed restrictions now appear right on the map. After loading an approach from the procedure advisor in the root editor, you'll see the familiar approach waypoints shown on the movie map. What's new is that ForeFlight now includes the Jeppesen source speed altitude, and IAF-FAF information for each waypoint marker in the procedure, even when the procedure plate isn't displayed. IAFs are shown with an IAF icon, intermediate fixes with an IF icon, and a cross icon represents the final approach fix. This feature is included in ForeFlight performance plans. And from generalaviationnews.com, applications now open for more than $100,000 in scholarships. The Aircraft Electronics Association will award more than 20 scholarships, totaling more than $100,000 for the 2020-21 to 21 school year to students pursuing a career in avionics or aircraft maintenance, as well as students from AEA member companies. Numerous scholarships are available, ranging from $1,000 to more than $35,000 each. Scholarship applications are available online. Deadline to submit is April 1, 2020. Since its inception, the AEA scholarship program has awarded more than 1.5 million in scholarships. And of course, we'll include a link in our show notes to the website where you can apply online for these AEA scholarships. And from AOPA.org, a nitrogen line explodes at the Wichita Beechcraft plant. A liquid nitrogen line ruptured and exploded at Textron's Beechcraft aircraft manufacturing plant in Wichita, Kansas on December 27th, sending about a dozen people to the hospital and shaking nearby residences, according to several news reports. Four other people were treated at the scene, and a partial collapse of plant number three structure was reported to have occurred. The facility was reported to have only a skeleton crew on duty when the explosion occurred at about 8 a.m. A four-inch natural gas line was severed by the blast, and traffic was blocked in the area of East Wichita, where the plant is located. Among other things, that plant houses prototypes of the Cessna Sky Courier, which is a twin-engine turboprop which is currently under development. Several hours after the explosion, hazardous materials responders remained on the scene, completing the draining of nitrogen-containing vessels in the damaged facility. And from the LATimes.com, a teen steals a small plane and crashes it into a fence and building at the Fresno airport. A 17-year-old girl was arrested after authorities said she sneaked into a small private plane at the Fresno Yosemite International Airport and crashed it into a chain-link fence in a building. The girl climbed over the airport's perimeter fence in the GA area and made her way to the pilot seat of a King Air 200 plane and managed to turn the engines on, according to a news release from the Yosemite International Airport. We're not certain how she was able to accomplish those things, said Drew Bessinger, chief of the airport police department in a news conference. Bessinger said the girl then crashed into the fence and building. When authorities responded to the scene at 7.30 a.m., they found the girl in the pilot seat wearing a headset. She was uncooperative and disoriented. Bessinger said there were cameras in the area, and the GA section of the airport had less fencing than the commercial area, about a quarter mile away. Bessinger said authorities don't know why the girl broke into the airport, but they don't believe it was a terrorism-related motive. No one was injured, airport spokeswoman Vicki Cauldron said, and the girl was booked into Juvenile Hall on suspicion of stealing an aircraft. 
And finally, from GeneralAviationNews.com, a heartwarming story about dog rescues. On December 20th, 2019, a Cessna full of rescue dogs in search of homes landed at Greenville Downtown Airport in South Carolina. Charlie Cato, a Tennessee pilot, volunteered to fly the animals to the airport thanks to travel arrangements made by the Rural Animal Rescue Effort, or RARE. RARE's mission is to seek out foster homes and adopters in more populated metropolitan areas to save more animals more rapidly than they can find in rural areas. In order to do this, an efficient transportation program is required. We average one to three transports per week. So far in 2019, we've transported 1,461 animals, said Laura Pretchell, Director of Transport for Rare. Up until last summer, they would all travel across our country's roads. Then a pilot reached out to us and asked if he could help. Now they are also taking to the sky, she said. Seven flights, relocating 92 animals, have departed and arrived at airports in Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina. This fall, Rare started a new partnership with the Greenville Humane Society, which happens to be located on an airport. GHS is a large no-kill shelter that has the ability to quickly find homes for the animals in their care, she continued. Many of these animals would not have a second chance at life without destination partners like GHS that are able to open their doors to animals in need. Located in Middle Tennessee, Rare is a nonprofit organization with a mission to rescue neglected animals and provide spay or neuter assistance in an effort to reduce extreme overpopulation and euthanasia of companion animals. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic on how to avoid controlled flight into terrain accidents. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now here are some few quick updates. First, I want to thank one of our Patreon super supporters, Jim Pittman, for this week's fun flying destination. Jim's an airline pilot and DPE, pilot examiner in the Phoenix area. And he pointed me to a YouTube video that his friend Carl Hancock posted just before Christmas. And I'm going to play the first two minutes of the audio from that video for this fun flying destination in Arizona. Tucked away in the Arizona mountains is one of the most beautiful red deserts in the world. Sedona, Arizona offers the best views of its red rocks from almost anywhere in the city. Couple that with some unique shopping and amazing hiking trails, and you've got one of the top must-visit destinations in Arizona. But if you're a pilot, it has a slightly different allure. From the air, the surrounding landscape is absolutely stunning. Aside from the landscape, Sedona does have something else to offer pilots. It has a one-of-a-kind airport. From the outside, it doesn't look like anything special, and it seems like your typical everyday uncontrolled airport, until you realize it sits atop a 500-foot mesa. Flying into Sedona is both beautiful and technical, but the airport itself has a 360-degree view of the surrounding mountains. With all this, it's hard not to put Sedona on your aviation bucket list. Now, I've flown to Sedona a lot this year, sharing it with friends and family, so I decided why not share it with you? Come along with me as we land at Sedona Airport. Now let's slow down for a minute and talk about landing in Sedona, because it's a bit different than landing anywhere else. Sedona's beauty can be a little distracting, but you still have to be on top of your game. The winds coming off the mesa can create downdrafts at each end of the runway, but they're not a problem as long as you're prepared. I typically come in a little high, which is fine because I'm in a Cessna 172, and runway 3 has an upslope that helps you slow down quickly. It's typical for pilots visiting to always land on runway 3 and take off on runway 21 because of this upslope. Winds allowing, of course. And I want to thank Carl Hancock for permission to use the audio from his video, and I've included a link to the full video in the show notes, and you're going to want to see the views when landing at Sedona. Or just go ahead and search for his channel on YouTube. It's called Fly With The Guys. Now, I think I've landed twice at Sedona, and I can tell you it's a spectacular airport and a beautiful town to visit as well. But I know that you also have a favorite airport somewhere near you, so please take a few moments to share with everyone what makes that airport and its surroundings so special. Just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on Listener Question at the top of the page, then you can use your smartphone to make an audio recording just keep it under 90 seconds or use a voice memos app on your phone and email it to me at aviationnewstalk at gmail.com. 
And speaking of videos, I saw a fun one recently of a helicopter uh, television reporter who brought along his girlfriend on a flight, and he was pretending to cover a story that was going on on the ground, and he asked her to report what she saw of the developing story below, and she reports that there's a large crowd of people around a big sign, and well, of course, the sign is a proposal. So if you'd like to see that video, I've included a link to it in the show notes. Now, if you've been following the news, you may have read about a Cirrus Vision jet that caught fire and burned while it was on the ground at Santa Monica Airport over the Christmas holidays. One of our listeners who asked to remain anonymous was at Santa Monica and took photos of the aircraft while it was on fire and again later after the fire was out. There's also a video on Instagram which shows the fire in progress. Now, on the day of the fire, I was bringing a new Vision jet from the factory to the West Coast and it was at one of the refueling stops that I first learned of the fire. And a number of you asked me what I know about the fire, so here's what little I know. A friend of mine talked with someone at Santa Monica, and here's what my friend relayed to me. All of this information is secondhand and totally unofficial, so take it all with a grain of salt. My friend was told that the owner-pilot had started the aircraft and was going through his checklist for about three minutes when he noticed a small amount of smoke in the cockpit. At first, he thought it was the windshield getting fogged up, And then later he thought perhaps his contacts were dirty and he tried to clean them. And then the smoke started to get a little thicker and it was coming from behind him. He looked over his right shoulder and didn't notice anything. Then he started to see a small amount of smoke and it started to get worse. That's when he shut down the engine and got out of the airplane with his dog. He then called for a couple of mechanics to help and they ran to get fire extinguishers. They leaned into the cockpit from the left wing and only saw smoke at first And then they sprayed their fire extinguishers when they saw the fire and tried to put the fire out, but it overwhelmed them and they withdrew. Now, apparently the fire started on the right side of the fuselage, uh, somewhere near to the right side of the second row of seats. This is in the area where there is a 110 volt outlet where people can plug in laptops and other devices. And apparently the NTSB and people from Cirrus were there for two days going over the plane. I'm told that one of those people said they looked at the inverter that powers the 110 volt outlet And they said that the inverter was okay and not the problem. Well, subsequently, on December 31st, Cirrus issued a service advisory, and it says, Cirrus has been made aware of a cabin fire incident in an SF-50 vision jet during ground operations. The operator observed smoke exiting from behind the right sidewall interior panel located behind the crew seat number two and forward of the passenger seat number five. Equipment located in this area of the cabin includes the in-flight entertainment, or IFE system, USB power outlets, and the 110-volt power supply. Power to all of this equipment can be removed via the IFE power switch located on the center console. Although an ongoing investigation has not yet identified a root cause for the incident, as a precaution and until more information is known, Cirrus Aircraft instructs owner-operators to set the IFE power switch to the off position at all times. This includes both ground operations and flight operations. Compliance with this advisor is required until further notice. So now you know everything I know, and you can bet we've turned that switch off the planes I fly. The only downside is that now we can't charge our iPhones and tablets in flight, but that's a pretty minor inconvenience. And I really want to applaud Cirrus for jumping on this issue immediately. Owners I know had phone calls from top Cirrus management within days afterwards, so I think the company's done an excellent job of keeping the community apprised of what they know about the problem. And speaking of the vision jet, I had another vision jet flight a couple of days ago. This time, instead of flying across the country, I flew an owner from his home base here in Northern California down to two different airports in Southern California for meetings. We initially planned to land at Cable Airport in Upland, California. Now, I wasn't real keen on that as it's about a 3,700-foot runway, and the airport's kind of shoehorned into some very tight space that's a cutout from the adjacent Class C for the Ontario, California airport. And you may recall that's the airport, Cable, where a Cirrus SR-22 crashed recently, and that crash was our main topic just six weeks ago on episode 130. So I knew more about that airport than I might have known otherwise. We were hoping to get the RNAV-6 approach, but instead we were given the visual approach to runway 24. When we switched from approach to the CTAF frequency, someone at the airport told us that straight-ins were not permitted for noise abatement reasons. So we overflew the airport at pattern altitude to make left traffic to runway 24. And then the guy on the CTAF came back on frequency and told us that the fuel island was out of service until about 3.30 p.m. Well, I have a rule of two, 
which is whenever I get to the second thing that isn't quite right, I punt and decide to fall back to my plan B. So I switched back to the approach frequency and told the controller that we wanted to go to Ontario. He laughed, and I'm guessing it's probably because we were only a few miles from Ontario, but I called him as the frequency was already loaded and was faster than trying to find the Ontario Tower frequency. But we landed at Ontario, and I hung out there for a number of hours and did some work, including finishing some writing on this podcast. And while I was there, Eric Gunderson, who helped me with episode 130 and works just a half mile from the airport, came by and took me to lunch, so it was fun to see him. Later, we flew the jet down to Gillespie Field in San Diego. While I was there, I met a nice crew from AeroCare Medical Transport System. They had flown a Learjet in there for a medevac flight. And once the owner was done with his meeting there, we flew back that evening to Northern California. And I must say, we had a spectacular view as we flew over LA at night at flight level 300. And I think I've just picked up two new Vision Jet clients in Southern California, so it looks like I'll be down there quite a bit in January and February. And I am posting lots of photos and videos from these flights on my Facebook and Instagram accounts. So if you're not already following me, go out to Instagram and follow Aviation News Talk, all one word. And on Facebook, you can find me at facebook.com slash max.trescott. And of course, there are links to both of those in the show notes. And hey, if you're enjoying the show, well, there's a way you can support the show and also get some goodies for yourself. And if you wonder why I talk about Patreon in every show, it's because while we get a few new supporters each month, we also lose supporters every month. For example, in December, we had nine people whose credit cards were declined. And in just the first few days of January, we had three people who decided to stop their contribution. So we're always looking for people to join us. And there are lots of goodies you can get at each of the contribution levels. For example, you can now get access to all of my online courses at pilotlearning.com when you sign up to donate monthly, either through PayPal or Patreon. And at this new $35 a month level, you can take the G1000 VFR and IFR courses and the WAS for flying GPS approach courses as many times as you'd like, as long as you're a member at the $35 a month support level or higher. And while I add new courses to the site, you'll get access to those courses as well. And of course, you get the show notes and early access to some of the new episodes, which are benefits at some of the lower donation levels. And I'd like to thank these new Patreon supporters who've joined us in the last three weeks. They include two new mega supporters who support us at the $50 a month level. Justin Winter has been licensed for three years and he has about 600 hours. He said his most memorable trip was a flight to the Turks and Caicos Islands in St. Martin. And he flew 3,600 miles with 20 hours of flying in eight days in his uh, 2019 Cirrus SR-22. And Carl Rossi, a longtime supporter of the show, has edited his pledge up to $50. Carl and Ann are of Maine Cooncat Aviation, and they are the proud owners and operators of three Cessna T240 aircraft. Other new supporters, I want to thank Russell Newman, John Stoll, Sam Wiltsius, and Sam, congratulations on getting your CFI recently, Tony Austin, Kyle Hecker, David Malkin, Johnny McDade, who's one of our new $35 a month uh, supporters. Vic Bajaj, who edited his contribution up to $8 a month. Michael Kenyard, who headed his up to two. And Ron Horton. We also have some one-time donations, people who've sent in checks. And I want to thank uh, an anonymous donor who sent us a check for $200. But I know he's not anonymous to Wick and Embry Dotson. <laughs> Those are his sons. So hello to them. I want to thank Jamie Neal for a $100 contribution. Preston Root for a $250 contribution, and Anthony Arcucci for a $15 donation who enjoyed our mock checkride episode. And on every new show, I briefly mention our mega supporters, and these include Brian Deere, who lives here in Northern California, recently acquired a Turbo 206. He was traveling down to Mexico, and we exchanged a lot of text messages about weather while he was down there. Tyson Weiss, who's the co-founder of Flight, Victor Vogel, who lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus. Tim Delaney, flying nearly 50 years, flies an SR-22 out of Northern California. Stephen Elop, who flies both a Turbo 182 and a Citation CJ3+. He's the CEO of API Jet. Larry Noe from New York City. He flies a Cirrus SR-22, which is pretty new to him. And Mike Williams, president of Kiomac and TCB Composites, maker of composite spinners and bulkheads for GA aircraft. He flies a 172. Seth Lake, he's a DPE who gives check rides and specializes in teaching in the multi-engine beach travel air that he has at his flight school, which you can find out about at vsl.aero, and that's down in Arkansas. 
Rick Miller, he instructs in the Cincinnati area, both out of the Lunkin Flight Training Center and also with individual owners in Piper's, Cessna's, Beechcraft, and Cicadas. And Justin Winter and Carl and Ann Rossi, who I mentioned earlier. And it's easy to support the show. If you'd like to do it via Patreon, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome and use a credit card to select the amount that you'd like to donate. Or just go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal if you'd like to make either a one-time donation or a regular monthly donation via credit card over PayPal. Now in a moment, we're going to talk about how to avoid CFIT, controlled flight into terrain accidents, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's talk about CFIT or controlled flight into terrain. Often when I bring up a topic on this show, it's because I've heard of an accident that was confounding and hard to understand why it happened. Or sometimes it's an accident that was seemingly completely avoidable and really heartrending because people could have survived if they'd only known about one small fact related to the accident. The accident that led me to talk about CFIT today falls into both categories. It's both confounding and hard to understand why it happened. And it should have been completely avoidable, though we don't have 100% of the facts surrounding the accident. And for those who say, oh, we should never speculate about the cause of an accident until we get the final NTSB report, I heartily disagree. Yes, if you only care about the cause of a particular accident, then yes, wait for the facts. But there's a lot that can be learned by talking about possible causes of an accident and about similar accidents. And while reading about this accident, I learned some things about the terrain awareness alerting capabilities of various avionics that I didn't know. So I found the online discussions about the accident productive, and we'll share that data with you. We're going to talk about several CFIT accidents today, but let's start with the one that prompted me to do this show. The accident occurred about 5.30 p.m. on November 26, 2019, just north of Las Vegas, Nevada. It was already dark in the area, and it appears that the aircraft flew into the side of Gas Peak, somewhere near the summit. From FlightAware.com data, it appears the aircraft was flying level at 6,600 feet, though more likely it was at 6,500 feet, which would be a standard VFR altitude for the aircraft's direction of flight. The aircraft was headed for the North Las Vegas airport. So in some ways, this accident is very understandable. Certainly, there have been lots of CFIT accidents where a pilot is flying VFR in the dark in a mountainous area. And you can well imagine that these kinds of accidents often occur when you have a relatively low-time pilot who's not instrument rated, who's unfamiliar with the terrain, is flying in the dark and can't see the mountains outside. And often these pilots are not getting flight following from ATC, which would presumably help keep them safe in these situations. And of course, many of these kinds of accidents occur in older, less capable aircraft that lack the modern glass cockpits and moving maps we have in newer aircraft that should keep you safe in these kinds of situations. So in many ways, you can see how it's totally understandable how an accident like this occurred. But there is a twist to this story, one which makes it hard to understand how this accident could have happened. So think about what that twist might be while we first talk about CFIT accidents in general. There are a lot of good resources on CFIT. For example, the FAA has an advisory circular on CFIT, and it's AC61-134, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. They also have a more condensed version produced by the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee that's called Controlled Flight into Terrain, and I'm going to read parts of it now. It starts by saying, Technological advances and situational awareness have dramatically reduced the number of GA controlled flight into terrain accidents over the past 20 years. Nonetheless, CFIT accidents continue to occur, and at least half of them are fatal. This fact sheet will help acquaint readers with the precursors of CFIT accidents and highlight some technological and safety risk management solutions. First, what is CFIT? CFIT is defined as an unintentional collision with terrain, either the ground, a mountain, a body of water, or an obstacle, while an aircraft is under positive control. Most often, the pilot or crew is unaware of the looming disaster until it's too late. CFIT most commonly occurs in the approach or landing phases of flight. Accidents where the aircraft is out of control at the point of impact are not known as CFIT. Rather, they are considered uncontrolled flight into terrain. Similarly, incidents resulting from deliberate acts such as terrorism or suicide by the pilot are also not considered to be CFIT. In a typical year, there are about 40 CFIT accidents, about half of which are fatal. Next, why does CFIT happen? And here's a pop quiz. CFIT accidents occur primarily at night, true or false? Well, surprisingly, the answer is false. It's logical to think that CFIT accidents usually involve inexperienced pilots in dark night in our IMC conditions. In reality, though, more than 75% of CFIT accidents in a typical year 
occur in daylight, and more than half of those are in visual conditions. Although pilots involved in most CFIT accidents are not instrument rated, more than 30% hold an instrument rating. As far as CFIT accident precursors, continued VFR into IMC is the deadliest, proving fatal in most cases. The GA Joint Steering Committee did a study on a group of 41 CFIT accidents. 11 or 25% of these accidents were preceded by continued VFR into IMC, and all of those were fatal. Six of those pilots were instrument rated, five were not. Another big factor in CFIT accidents is wire strikes. You might think most wire strikes are confined to agricultural flying, but more than half do not involve this type of operation. Accident data also shows that wire strikes often occur below 200 feet above ground level. If you've got to fly low, give yourself room. A little extra altitude, even 500 feet, will keep you above 90% of the wires. Other top causes of CFIT are IFR procedural mistakes, for example, flight below minimum and route altitude, descent below the MDA, and unrealistic aircraft performance expectations, such as high density altitude, tailwinds on approach. To avoid these pitfalls, make sure you're in compliance with all aspects of the clearances you accept and the procedures you fly. Equally important is to thoroughly research the environment you plan to operate in, especially at high altitudes and or shorter obstructed runways. How can I avoid CFIT? Well, safety risk management is a vital part of warding off a possible CFIT accident. It involves knowing what you're getting into and understanding what capabilities and resources you have that will ensure a flight is completely safe. This starts at pre-flight. Make use of a flight risk assessment tool and the PAVE acronym to help you build a personalized risk assessment before a flight. During flight, you also need to stay vigilant of any changing conditions like deteriorating weather, fuel status, and the onset of fatigue. Be ready and willing to adjust your plans. Don't let plan continuation bias, aka get their itis, lure you into making a poor decision. Having a plan be at the ready can make a route change much easier to rationalize and accept. There are a host of technological programs, applications, and devices that can aid pilots in situational awareness and risk assessment, such as moving maps with terrain overlays. In fact, pilots have access to more information than ever before, and that has already contributed to a 20-year reduction in CFIT accidents. But all that information comes in many different forms, so pilots must be thoroughly familiar with and proficient in device operation and information interpretation. Technology can also lead to unwanted distractions, so remember to always fly the aircraft first. Tips and best practices? Keep your skills sharp between flights by flying simulators or flight training devices. Many feature realistic graphics so you can get a look at unfamiliar destination environments, and you can practice instrument procedures before you have to fly them for real. But remember, simulation is not adequate preparation for flights to unfamiliar and or challenging environments. Therefore, you should also make it a part of your plan to get regular proficiency training with a flight instructor. Of course, we recommend FAA Wings Pilot Proficiency Training, but no matter what program or instructor you choose, try to include scenario-based training. Finally, be sure to give yourself some breathing room. That means at least a mile from airspace and 2,000 feet vertically from terrain you're trying to avoid. And since weather is very dynamic, you may consider even greater clearance distances to avoid any unexpected IMC. Now, my thanks to the GA Joint Steering Committee for producing that, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes. And to all of this, let me add, you may want to practice a CFIT escape maneuver, first in a simulator and later in an aircraft with an instructor. Now, you'll have to decide what the best maneuver would be for your airplane, but I think a VX climb and a turn in the direction toward lower terrain would probably make sense. And if you ask, why not a VY climb? Well, let me point out that VX gives you the greatest gain in altitude for a given distance traveled forward. And if you have high terrain in front of you, you probably want to maximize your climb while minimizing the distance you travel toward the high terrain. Sometimes when I teach, I'll simulate a terrain warning and call out, terrain, pull up, terrain, pull up. And when I do that, I expect pilots to react to that and immediately start a climb. And I must tell you, I have killed a number of pilots in the simulator, and hopefully there are better pilots for it. A typical IFR clearance out of my home airport is an initial climb to 3,000 feet, and then we're told to expect to climb to 5,000 feet within five minutes. In the simulator, I leave them at 3,000 feet, and very few of them notice the terrain before hitting it. I once did some training for a local aerial imaging company, and after killing one of their very junior pilots in the sim, he protested that he'd learned to fly in Southern California and that they always trusted the controllers to keep them safe. Well, hopefully he now knows that he can trust controllers, but that he should always verify that he's at a safe altitude, because sometimes... On rare occasions, 
Controllers make a mistake, and you don't want to die because of a mistake. Now let's shift gears and talk about a wrinkle in the ATC rules that could kill you if you're not fully aware of the distinction of being vectored while VFR versus being vectored while IFR. And I think this is a common misunderstanding by pilots. So if you'll remember nothing else from today's show, remember what I'm about to tell you. Section 556 of the AIM or Aeronautical Information Manual tells us about the differences between getting vectored when you're VFR versus IFR. Let's talk about what the controller does. If we jump down to B subsection three, it says that the controller quote, vectors IFR aircraft at or above minimum vectoring altitudes. Okay, no surprise there. If you're an IFR pilot, you know that the controller is supposed to always vector you at or above the MVA or minimum vectoring altitude, which is above the terrain and will keep you safe. Now let's look at the very next line, B subsection four. It says that the controller quote, may vector VFR aircraft not at an ATC assigned altitude, at any altitude. In these cases, terrain separation is the pilot's responsibility. Now, hopefully this just hits you like a lightning bolt. Imagine you're out flying around at night in your VFR. There are mountains around, but you can't see them. You're getting vectors from a controller and you know that you're VFR because you're not on an IFR flight plan. And at some point, just to remind you, the controller may have said, maintain VFR. Under 556A subsection one, it says that the pilot, quote, promptly complies with headings and altitudes assigned to you by the controller. So there you are, you're dutifully following all the turns the controller gives you. You have this warm, comfortable feeling that you're safe because the controller is vectoring you and there's nothing you need to worry about. And then bam, you hit the side of a mountain. In that situation, who's at fault? The controller? No, of course not, because when flying VFR, the pilot is always responsible for terrain separation, even if you're getting vectors from the controller and even if it's pitch black outside and you can't see the mountain you're about to hit. So yes, if you're out flying around VFR, you have no guarantee that the vectors you've been given will keep you safe. So now when you think about it, it's easy to understand how some of these CFIT accidents occur. Now let's talk about a CFIT accident that occurred on December 23rd, 1995 in nearby San Jose, California. I'm reading now from the NTSB's final report. The aircraft impacted mountainous terrain and controlled flight during hours of darkness and marginal VFR conditions. The flight was being vectored for an instrument approach during the pilot's Part 135 instrument competency check flight. So just for clarification, this was a charter pilot. He was flying a Piper Navajo and he was doing his required Part 135 competency check. Back to the report, the flight was instructed by approach control to maintain VFR conditions and was assigned a heading and altitude to fly, which caused the aircraft to fly into another airspace sector below the MVA or minimum vectoring altitude. The controller handbook 7110.65 requires that if a VFR aircraft is assigned both a heading and altitude simultaneously, the altitude must be at or above the MVA. So this is a very interesting point. If you're VFR and the controller is just giving you vectors, but not giving you altitudes, you're responsible for terrain clearance. But if he or she gives you a heading and an altitude simultaneously, the altitude must be at or above the MVA. And I did look up section 5-6-1 of the controller handbook, and it still has a note which says, note, VFR aircraft not at an altitude assigned by ATC may be vectored at any altitude. It is the responsibility of the pilot to comply with the applicable parts of CFR Title 14. The final NTSB report goes on to say the controller did not issue a safety alert, and in an interview he said he was not concerned when the flight approached an area of higher minimum vectoring altitudes because the flight was VFR and, quote, pilots fly VFR below the MVA every day. At the time of the accident, the controller was working six arrival sectors and experienced a surge of arriving aircraft. The approach control facility supervisor was monitoring the controller and did not detect and correct the vector below the MVA. The NTSB found the probable cause of this accident to be, quote, the failure of the air traffic controller to comply with instructions contained in the Air Traffic Control Handbook, FAA Order 7110.65, which resulted in the flight being vectored at an altitude below the MVA and failure to issue a safety advisory. In addition, the controller's supervisor monitoring the controller's action failed to detect and correct the vector below the MDA. Factor in the accident was the flight crew's failure to maintain situational awareness of nearby terrain and failure to challenge the controller's instructions. But of course, it was dark outside and the flight crew could not see the surrounding terrain, but they're still responsible for avoiding it. 
Which brings us to the question, how do you determine a safe altitude when it's dark or you're in marginal VFR conditions and you can't see the terrain? The answer is, you better not rely on just looking out the window. And if you do, you're putting you and your passengers at risk. And often, you can't just figure out in that moment how to determine where the terrain is. You need to have done your homework ahead of time. And that homework could be as simple as just examining a chart before your flight to determine the minimum safe altitudes for your route of flight. If you look at a VFR sectional chart, the large numbers in each square are the MEFs or minimum elevation figures. Those figures are as little as 200 feet above the highest terrain in that sector. So you'll probably want to add a minimum of 500 feet to any of the MEFs you choose for a safe altitude. Now, a great way to fly VFR at night is to fly along airways and to choose an altitude that's above the MEA or the minimum in route altitudes. The MEAs are guaranteed to be at least 1,000 feet above terrain and at least 2,000 feet above terrain in the mountainous areas. And you're going to find those MEAs on an IFR chart. In addition to checking charts, there are numerous terrain awareness devices, some portable such as an iPad, and some built into the aircraft that you can use to make yourself aware of the height of nearby terrain. Some of these will also provide audio alerts if there is higher terrain ahead of you. But the operation of these devices varies considerably, so you need to make it a priority to invest the time ahead of time, like days or weeks before a flight, to learn all of the details around the operation of whatever device it is that you're going to bet your life on to display the relative height of surrounding terrain. Most of these devices are color-coded to show you whether the terrain is above or below you, and the colors change as you change altitude. A typical color scheme, but not one that's used universally, so you need to learn the color scheme for your device, is to use red to depict terrain that is above your present altitude or as little as 100 feet below your present altitude. So if you fly into a portion of a moving map that's red, yeah, well, you're dead. Yellow is often used to depict terrain that's somewhere between 100 feet and 1,000 feet below you. So while you might think, well, hey, I see yellow, I'm safe, consider this. If you're over a yellow portion of the map, the rocks could be as little as 100 feet below you. And if there are 100-foot trees on those rocks, well, again, you're dead. So don't consider yourself safe when you're flying over yellow unless you have a clear view of how far above the rocks you really are. Some systems show black when you're more than 1,000 feet above the rocks. Other systems show green if the terrain is between 1,000 and 2,000 feet below you, and then show black if you're more than 2,000 feet above the ground. Now, all modern glass cockpits, like the G1000 or Perspective, and all modern standalone GPS navigators, such as the Garmin GTN 650 and 750, depict relative terrain, and you should know how to select it for display in your aircraft. And here's a really important point. Many of these G1000 aircraft don't have TAWS or Terrain Awareness Warning System that will give an audible terrain pull-up warning as you approach terrain. TAWS is an option in some aircraft, and some owners of, for example, G1000, Cessna 172s, and 182s may have decided not to spend the extra $9,000 to get that option when they bought the plane. So even if you have a G1000 system, in some of these aircraft, if you don't have relative terrain selected for viewing, you can fly into the side of a mountain and you will never get any warning before hitting terrain. So I recommend that whenever you fly at night or in low visibility, that you have relative terrain selected so you can view it. That way, if you're in an aircraft without TAWS, you can see the higher terrain on the moving map and avoid it, and you don't have to rely on the optional TAWS giving you an audio alert. And by the way, there was an accident in November 2007 in which two retired airline captains, each with over 25,000 hours of total time, were flying a G1000-equipped Civil Air Patrol Cessna 182 in the Las Vegas area in the dark just after 7 p.m. at night. They departed North Las Vegas Airport, which coincidentally is the same airport at which our first CFIT accident aircraft, the one with a twist of the story, was headed to. It was a clear dark night when they flew southwest. They flew into the side of Mount Potosi, which is 8,500 feet tall, hitting it at the 7,500 foot level. The TAWS option was not installed on that airplane. If it had been, it would have yelled at them, terrain, pull up, as they approached the mountain. Instead, these pilots had to select terrain for display on the G-1000's moving map, which they probably didn't. The aircraft was flying under VFR rules, and what would you guess? Do you think they were or were not getting flight following at the time? Okay, time's up. They were getting flight following, and they were not given a warning from ATC before hitting the mountain. 
And as you now know, ATC was not required to give them any warning if they hadn't assigned them an altitude at which to fly. Now, if the aircraft you fly in can't display relative terrain on a moving map, then unless you fly only in the daytime and only on severe clear days, you need to have some type of tablet device or smartphone running some type of EFB software such as ForeFlight or Garmin Pilot so that you can display relative terrain when you fly. And if you have one of those apps and you don't know how to turn on relative terrain, make a commitment to yourself to learn how to display relative terrain before your next flight. And here's an interesting situation where it pays to know all the details of how relative terrain is displayed on your system. About a week ago, I was flying a vision jet at night into Medford, Oregon. I asked for the ILS-14 and was cleared to cross Sammy at 7,000 feet. That aircraft has a Garmin G3000 glass cockpit, and I had what they called the inset window, which you would call the profile view in a G1000 or perspective aircraft, displayed along the bottom of the moving map. So not only did I have terrain displayed on the moving map, but I had essentially a side view of my flight path and a depiction of how high I would be above the terrain at every point. Interestingly, because of the way I had the system configured, the profile view on the G1000 didn't show me the terrain I would encounter if I failed to make the 90-degree turn at Sammy. That's because the inset window was configured in flight plan mode to show the terrain along the flight path accounting for all of our planned turns along the way. Thus, if you have a sharp turn, the profile view won't show the terrain that's ahead of you just past the turn. By contrast, you can go into the inset window settings and select track mode so that you see all of the terrain directly in front of you on your present ground track for hundreds of miles. So that's an example of why you want to study how your system works so that you're familiar with all the subtleties of when terrain is and is not depicted on the map. Now let's get back to the first accident we talked about, the one with a twist. Actually, there are many twists, because virtually nothing I suggested about how a CFIT accident like this one might occur was true about that accident. You may recall I said, and you can well imagine that these kinds of accidents often occur when you have a relatively low-time pilot who's not instrument rated, who's unfamiliar with the terrain, is flying in the dark, and can't see the mountains outside. Though that part about flying in the dark was true. And often I said, these pilots are not getting flight following from ATC, which would presumably help keep them safe in these situations. And of course, many of these kinds of accidents occur in older, less capable aircraft that lack the modern glass cockpits and moving maps. We have a newer aircraft that should keep you safe in these kinds of situations. Although the NTSB has not released a preliminary report for this accident, friends of the pilot have shared a lot of information. The pilot was an experienced pilot who was instrument rated, and he had lots of local knowledge as he was based at the North Las Vegas airport. Not only that, he was a retired air traffic controller who presumably was intimately familiar with ATC procedures in the Las Vegas area. He was reportedly flying VFR under clear though dark skies with no moon and had apparently requested vectors from Nellis Approach for a VFR practice approach to the ILS-12 left at North Las Vegas airport. His wife and mother-in-law were on board, and he was apparently returning home from a trip he just made a few hours earlier to Lake Havasu City, Arizona. And the aircraft he was flying was a Cirrus SR-22. So presumably this pilot had just about everything going for him, yet he still flew into the side of a mountain. Now, one pilot who lives in the Las Vegas area commented online that he's gotten vectors for the ILS-12 left at North Las Vegas, but never ones that took him that far north. And if you're vectored to the south of Gas Peak, you're over much lower terrain. If you look at the winds aloft at the time of the accident, they were from the south at almost 20 knots, so it's entirely possible the controller was giving the normal vectors he's given in the past, but that the winds were taking the aircraft's track further to the north toward Gas Peak. The top of Gas Peak is listed on a sectional chart as being at 6,943 feet. Now, oddly, that puts the top 443 feet of the mountain in Class B airspace, as the mountain penetrates the 6,500-foot to 10,000-foot outer ring of the Class B that surrounds Las Vegas. And it's the only case I know where you need a Class B clearance to be 400 feet underground. In some ways, this unusual airspace may have contributed in a small way to the accident, as this pilot may have felt he needed to stay at 6,500 feet to remain clear of the Class B. And you might ask, how could an aircraft equipped as well as a Cirrus fly into the side of a mountain? And yes, if this were a newer Cirrus, it's highly unlikely this accident would have occurred. But this was a very old Cirrus SR-22 
that was built in 2001, and it was not nearly as well equipped as current aircraft, particularly in its depiction of terrain and its terrain alerting capabilities. The accident aircraft was serial number 15, making it one of the very first SR-22s ever built. The owner had just purchased the plane in March, so he'd had the aircraft around eight months before the accident. These early versions of the SR-22 had round gauges and an RNAV MFD, which lacked many of the capabilities of the Avidyne MFD that began shipping in 2003 aircraft. So when shipped, these aircraft didn't have the same kinds of relative terrain capability found in newer planes. However, the accident plane had been significantly upgraded at some point. Two of the round gauges had been replaced with an Aspen Avionics Evolution PFD. It had also been retrofitted with the Avidyne MFD that began shipping in 2003. It's unclear whether the pair of Garmin 430s were upgraded, but if they had been, they would have had terrain warning alerts. The aircraft also had a PS Engineering audio panel and an Avidyne DFC-90 autopilot, which in my mind is far superior to the Estec autopilots that were shipped in early Cirrus aircraft. The pilot had also added an iPad mount just above his knees, so for sure he could have seen relative terrain on this device if and only if he had the terrain layer selected for display at the time of the accident. There were also some discussions online about whether this particular Aspen PFD would give audible terrain alerts. One person commented that there was a synthetic vision option for the PFD, but that the pilot must enable it every time they get into the airplane. Someone else commented that the new Promax version of the PFD runs synthetic vision in the background, and even if you have not turned on the display, that it will give oral warnings of terrain, but only if the PFD has been connected to the audio panel. The point, of course, is that avionics capabilities vary widely depending upon software revisions, options that have or haven't been purchased, and the specific way that a system has been interconnected with other devices in your cockpit. So, here's a New Year's resolution I'd like you to adopt for yourself. If you're not familiar with 100% of the relative terrain capabilities of the devices in your airplane or in your EFB apps like ForeFlight and Garmin Pilot, I want you to commit to learning everything you can about turning these features on and using them in flight. And then make sure that you always enable relative terrain anytime it's dark or visibility is limited. Because the life you save with this additional knowledge, yeah, it may be your own. And speaking of learning everything you can about your aircraft and its avionics, just wanted to mention that my Max Trust Guts G1000 and Perspective Glass Cockpit Handbook is back in stock. We ran out of books here for a few weeks, but a new print run has been accomplished. And if you're interested in that book, you can just order it at 800-247-6553. Now, if you haven't seen this, this is a huge book, 306 pages long, great index in the back, makes it very easy to find any feature that you have a question about on the G1000. So just give a call, 800-247-6553. The book is $34.95 plus shipping. And finally, please take a moment to show your aviation friends how they can get the Aviation News Talk podcast. And if they don't know what a podcast is, and yes, half of the people in the country don't know what it is, just send them out to the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store to download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast apps for iOS and Android, because everybody knows how to download an app. In the App Store, just search for Aviation News Talk. And of course, those apps are free. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up.